Well, hello, everybody. Hello. Ooh, getting a little feedback up here. Uh, happy High Holy Day to you. It is, man, it's awesome to be here. Such an incredible day, such an incredible time that we have had uh, this, last, this last week, and, and what a meaningful time this is. This last day of unleavened bread, uh, as we come before God to worship him, turn over with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 13. We are, we're going to take a little bit of a unique approach to this afternoon's service. Uh, we're going to study a little bit, and then we are all going to get involved in the worship service today, not just in our singing, but with our voices and with what the Lord has done in our lives. So uh, let's, uh, let's dive in here uh, to uh, Exodus chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 3. And Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, the eternal, the Lord, Yahweh, brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the eternal, the Lord, brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you in the land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Verse 6, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall be leaven seen among you in all of your quarters. We see the command in Exodus 13. We also see it in Exodus 12. We see it in Leviticus 23. We see it in Deuteronomy 16. We see multiple times throughout the Old Testament where we are called to celebrate this feast of unleavened bread. But we also see the duality, as we've talked about, Old Testament and New Testament. We see the command to celebrate Passover, the, the day when the Israelites were called to, to sacrifice a lamb, to spill its blood, and to put the blood over the doorposts of their homes, and that they would be delivered, their firstborn would be saved, but all that didn't have that blood would not. And the Egyptians, the firstborn of all the households, that didn't have the blood of the lamb, they lost their firstborn. Just as we see the blood of our lamb, Jesus Christ, our Passover, covers us, sanctifies us, sets us apart, redeems us back to the Father. And these, these days of unleavened bread that were set aside by God, by our eternal Father in heaven, that in these days... They were set aside to commemorate, to, to remember every single year the deliverance that Israel had from the bondage of Egypt. And we see in our lives, the parallel for us today, the blood of the lamb sets us free from our bondage. Turn over, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. This is such a deeply personal time in our lives and in the plan of God. This is, this is not just something we do because we're following a legalistic practice. This is not something we do because we don't believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. This is something we do because when we understand and we have the veil removed from our eyes and we can read the command of God, we see just how much love he has for us. We're going to read here in, in Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start uh, in verse, um, well, you know what, we'll just start in the first verse. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? When we become baptized into Jesus Christ, the old man is put to death. We are buried with him. Verse 4, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. We have been given an opportunity, our lives bound to sin, sin the slave master that pulls us to death. 
through the blood of our Passover, through Christ our Passover, we have been redeemed. We celebrate these feasts of unleavened bread because of the redemption that we have, because of the freedom that we have from bondage. But verse 5, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin." Now, if we died from Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord." Man, what an incredible thing. These are not just words on a page, but when you sit and you just understand how deeply personal this time is. This is not a time where we are just going through the motions, where we are just practicing a religious observance that doesn't really have any meaning. It's not like we're washing our hands and there's not really any symbolism there. This is so deeply meaningful to every one of us. This is such a personal time. When we read through this, as we read through, think, put your name in there. For if Adam has been united with together in the likeness of his death. Certainly Adam shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Put your name in there. Because this is what this time memorializes for us every year when we get together. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with God the Father. We have personally, each one, been delivered just as the Israelites were delivered from their bondage, we have been delivered from the bondage of our sin. And I want us to be thinking about that today as we, we go throughout the, the service and as we, we talk through what we're going to be talking through today because every single one of us, the point between death and deliverance, the point between bondage and freedom Every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a testimony. Every one of us has a very unique experience by which God reached down and put his loving hand on your shoulder and said, this is not the way. This is not the way I want you to be walking because the way that you are walking right now is the way that leads to death. This is the way. This is the way I want you to walk. This is the shed blood for you that has been shed to cover your sins. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that Adam, that Kyle, that Jamie, that TK, that Johnny, that Ashley, that Joni, that Angela would not be put to death but would have life everlasting This is such a deeply personal experience and such a deeply personal practice that we go through every year. Turn over with me again to Colossians chapter 2. We have a celebration that we celebrate here. And this celebration that we are celebrating is not of ourselves. Nothing that we have done here is of ourselves. The redemption that we have in Christ Jesus is not of ourselves. We are celebrating a victory that Christ Jesus had in each one of our lives. And in Colossians chapter 2, we're going to read, starting in verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Verse 11, and in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith. 
in, working, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead to your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Every one of us had a requirement through the law of death. Because every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, before Jesus came into our lives, before his blood covered the doorpost of this body, of this tabernacle, we were dead to sin. But through him, through him, we have had our trespasses the handwriting of requirements completely wiped away. This is what we celebrate these days of unleavened bread. Christ, our Passover, died for us. And I want you to think just, just how personally God has worked in your life. I want you to think just how personally God has come in and picked you from your chains, broken those chains, and set you bound to him for life everlasting. And if we continue reading in Colossians, Colossians 3 has a lot to say about the old man and the battle that we will continue to wage against the old man. In fact, let's just read a little bit here of Colossians chapter 3. Uh, in verse 1 it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. When Christ appears again, the fall festival, the fall holy days, picture the time when Jesus Christ will come back onto this earth, when he will usher in the kingdom of God, when death will be defeated forever, and we will be with him in glory. Therefore, Small ask here, small ask, therefore put to death your members which are on this earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves also walked when you lived in them. This is the bondage that we were in, the bondage of sin that leads to death, and God will visit his wrath upon the sons of disobedience because of these things. So put those members to death. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Justin talked about on the first holy day, if we put all of these things out, but there's not something that we replace them with. How easy is it for the demon that is cast out to come back and find the house swept clean and come back with his friends? Verse 12, this is what we are to replace it with, the character of the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, uh, admonitioning one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We, we have these physical practices that we go through every year because we live in physical bodies. We have a carnal man that still exists within us even though the old man has been put to death. The handwriting of requirements has been wiped away. We still have an old man that exists. We still have a physical body which is why every year we get together and we celebrate this physical practice. But this has such deep meaning for every single one of us. And there's a command that we have here Turn back to Exodus chapter 13. We just read that we are to encourage one another, that we are to speak to one another in psalms and in songs and in spiritual hymns and spiritual songs. In Exodus chapter 13, I stopped reading at the end of uh, verse 7. I want to start in verse 8. After this command... It says, and you shall tell your son in the day, saying, this is done because of what the Lord, what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. There is a command that we have to memorialize the deliverance that each one of us has in our lives. But it's not just enough for us to keep it silent. It's not just enough for us to remember each year. God has given us a command to share with others what he has done for us in our lives. And so today we're going to do something just a little bit different. To honor this, we're going to practice this together. I I told you at the beginning that I wanted you to be thinking about how deeply personal this time is to each of us. I mentioned that each one of us has a testimony And we have a command here to tell of the deliverance that we have, each one of us. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to break for a minute from me teaching, and we are going to share together our testimonies. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to break up into small groups, three, four people. And what I'd really like to encourage you to do as we think of the deliverance that each one of us has This doesn't have to be the testimony of your life. But I want you to think maybe five minutes. Maybe if you could summarize in five minutes just exactly what God means to you. Just exactly how he has delivered you in your life. And before we break, we're going to pray. And after you've shared your testimony, I want to encourage you to pray with one another. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to share my testimony with you. Uh, a testimony, there's, there's no formula to it. But a testimony of deliverance, it speaks of where you were and what God has done in your life. And it all serves to glorify our Father in heaven. So let me share with you mine. If I was to summarize in five minutes, I, I've, I've shared with many of you many times my testimony. But where I was before the blood of the lamb covered my, my uh, physical body, my, my spiritual body before I was risen with Christ. I walked in sin. All of the things that we just told bring wrath, bring wrath on the sons of disobedience, I participated in. I tried very hard in my life to fulfill something that was missing with all of the physical things. And it brought nothing but emptiness. It brought nothing but depression to the point I had tried so hard in my life to fill my life with these physical things and I received nothing but dissatisfaction. I received nothing but depression. I was at a point in my life where I was ready to end my life. I was ready to end my life. And I tried. I, uh, I, I tried to do that. And... It was through that experience that God reached down with his love and his mercy. And he picked me up and he said, son, I love you. And from that point forward, I received a fulfillment in the Lord. I received 
something from God that had meaning beyond anything, any physical practice, anything that I could do for myself. God delivered me from physical death that all I could do was going to bring me physical death. God reached down in his love and in his mercy and he gave me life everlasting when all I could do was bring death for myself. God was so merciful that he delivered me from the chains of death, the chains of sin that were literally going to bring me death. And so that's how I believe because I know I have seen with my own eyes, I have experienced in my life just exactly what God means to me. And I know because I have shared my testimony with others that there are people who have gone through exactly the same thing. I know that there are people walking around in this world that are so lost, that are so empty because they are trying to fulfill their lives with the things of this world. That there are people who need to hear what God has done in my life because I'm not unique. I'm not special because I've had these experiences. There are so many others, and I know that we serve a loving God that wants life everlasting, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and baptism and receive this gift that I have received. I want you to be thinking about your testimony. Before we break, we're going to pray. And after we, we, we are done, when, when we're praying for one another, the reason that I'm going to ask that we do this individually, that, that we're groups of three or four, is because it's really easy for us to sit back, maybe one or two or three or four or five people are up here on stage giving their testimony, and I think that that's such a powerful thing, and I want us to do more of that. But God has reached down in every one of our lives personally, Every one of our lives, he has done something to deliver us, whether it's small or whether it's great. Whether you grew up in the faith, you have known this word your entire life, and, and, and God granted mercy on you that from a very young age, you didn't have to go through the things that I went through. You didn't have to live a life of sin in order for God to say, listen, son or daughter, I want you to accept the sacrifice that I have prepared for you. It doesn't have to be a crazy story like what I just said. But God has done something in each one of our lives personally. But God has brought every one of us to this body intentionally. Every one of the experiences that we have gone through, every one of our deliverance from our sin, God will use in somebody else's life because guess what? Just like there are people who have been through what I've been through, there are people who have been through what you have been through. And God will use your testimony if you are willing to share it to bring glory to him. I want to pray. Almighty God, as we come before you, as we come together on this high holy day, this special time when we commemorate the deliverance that you have provided for us, I want to pray that you would bring to memory, bring to mind just how deeply personal this is for each one of us. I pray, Lord, as, as we split, as we divide, as we get together individually, Father, that you would just put a pressing on each one of our hearts as to who we are to share our testimony with. Because I know in this world there are people who need to hear the deliverance that you have given to each one of us. But I know that in this room there are people who can be encouraged by our individual testimonies. And so I pray that you would do the sorting. I pray that you would do the dividing here today, Lord. That you would put a pressing on each one of our lives who we should be, or put a pressing on our mind who we should share our lives with here today. And I pray that we would all be encouraged through this time of testimony. I pray, Father, that you would use this to edify the body. Because this is such a deeply personal relationship with you, Lord. I just pray that you would bless this time that we have. And I pray this in the most holy name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. So as we divide here, uh, if you'll... You'll just be thinking about it, maybe say a, a quick prayer to yourself. Let's, let's split, maybe groups of, of three to four, uh, teens, young adults, uh, kids, I, I would highly encourage you to be involved in this as well, because this is deeply personal for every one of us. 
So let's, let's split up. Let's, let's spend a few minutes sharing our testimonies with one another. Let's spend a few minutes praying with one another, and then we'll get back together up here and we'll finish out today's message. Man, it is, it is awesome. It is just absolutely incredible to see everybody gathering together. Uh, I, I learned from, from our group up here things about people that I, I didn't know. Uh, areas where, where God has worked in my brothers and my sisters' lives that I didn't know. And I hope the same is, is true of yours. I, I hope that we were able to take this time and, and really just pour into one another. I want to read two scriptures as, as we, we close here. Uh, one of them is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to read the, the symbolism that Paul, that Paul reads here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, he says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, really interesting symbolism that he says here, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. How many of you have heard of a diffuser? Essential oils, anybody? Everybody in this room, Texas is all about essential oils is what I've learned since I've been here. (laughs) And through us, he diffuses that fragrance. Think about taking a couple of drops of peppermint oil or thieves oil or whatever it is that you diffuse in your diffuser and and, and spreading that around, right? The aroma spreading throughout. For he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? The the symbolism here, I I did a little bit of digging into the the mindset here, and if you think about uh, in in the times when Paul was writing this, uh, the Romans would go out to war, and when they were victorious, the army would come marching through the main street. And there would be the king or the officers, there would be the soldiers, then there would be priests, and then there would be the captives. And as they were walking, the priests would be diffusing incense, they would be burning incense, right? And that incense, to those who were the soldiers, to those who were in battle, who were victorious, the smell of that incense was victory. It was life. But to the captives who walked behind, the smell of that incense was death. It was bondage because they were going either to be slaves or to be put to death. And in the same way, our testimonies that we just shared, think about the incredible wisdom. Could you have planned the testimony of the person that shared in your group? Absolutely not. I couldn't have shared the way that God has worked in the lives of Alex and Johnny and Angela. I couldn't have have planned that out. And that aroma, that fragrance that we are in Christ shows the knowledge of God in every place that we go. God has given us such a deeply personal relationship with him because he wants us But it's not enough for us to just come into relationship. He wants us to be bearing fruit for his kingdom. That means that we're sharing for those, as it says here, to to one, the aroma of death leading to death, and to another, the aroma of life leading to life. We are in this life together. We are soldiers marching victorious because Christ, our king, has conquered And in him we are more than conquerors. We sang about it. We are conquerors through him. And we have all been given such an incredible testimony. Let's be encouraging one another with those testimonies, small and great, just like we talked about a couple of days ago. But that's also for us to be sharing with those in the world. Those who still have the chains of bondage. Those who still feel so empty. Those who are walking around with no hope. Because that fragrance 
can be a sweet smelling aroma to them too when they understand the knowledge, the wisdom that God has, the, the, the glory that he is willing to share with each of us. In closing, let's turn over to one more scripture, over to, to Psalm chapter 44. It's so important that we share with our friends, with our family, with those around us in our communities. And in Psalm chapter 44, we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies. And you have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we will boast all day long and praise your name forever. Every one of those testimonies in our lives, every person in this room who has been delivered from the bondage of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have this same testimony. We have not been delivered by our hand. There is nothing of our lives that we have done to bring ourselves to this glory that God has freely given to us through his free gift of grace. We don't trust in our sword to deliver us. We trust in him. And in our God, we will boast all day long. We will boast in these victories. We will sing these praises. We will be the aroma of God to those who are living to life, to those who are dying the aroma of death. We will be that. We will glorify God. Let's glorify him together. Let's keep sharing these testimonies. Let's keep pouring into one another, encouraging each other in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs. Let's continue pressing forward, pressing forward to the kingdom. Let's praise him.